I talk to people as if it's a career choice. It's not a career choice. It's a lifetime choice. Okay. <clears throat> and I said, you have to understand that if you've been at it for five or ten years, this is a life sentence. And a massive transformative purpose is what you're telling the world. It's like, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. This is the dent I'm going to make in the universe. Everybody, welcome to Moonshots and Mindsets. Uh, I am here with Dan Sullivan, and we're going to be talking about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Uh, what are the most important attributes of an entrepreneur? Uh, what does it take to succeed? How do you know if you're an entrepreneur? And what does it mean once you become an entrepreneur? So stay tuned for an extraordinary conversation with uh, the head of strategic coach, the founder, a dear friend, the man who inspired me to create Abundance 360, my coach, Dan Sullivan. Everybody, Peter Diamandis here. Welcome to our next episode of Exponential Wisdom. I'm here with my dear friend, Dan Sullivan. And today we're going to talk about something that is near and dear to both of our hearts, and it's the entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about this, Dan, but like what makes an entrepreneur? What are the highs and lows, the pros, the cons of being an entrepreneur? What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? Uh, how do you succeed at it? And how do you know if it's right for you? So uh, this is a subject that uh, both you and I exude from our pores and excited to, to jump in. Well, it's a, it's a very recent concept because if you go back and check the dictionary, uh, the best definition was 1804. And that was a Frenchman by the name of Jean-Baptiste Say. And he said, entrepreneurs are someone who, take, who takes resources from a lower level lower level of productivity to a higher level of productivity. So entrepreneurs improve things. They, they, take, they take existing things, they create new things, but they take resources. And he was asked, uh, what kind of resource? And he said, any kind of resource. And um, just a little note, and then I'll pass it on to you, whether you've heard other definitions, but the, uh, he was asked, and uh, there was no such thing as, um, Entrepreneur was a really new term as we use it today. And his, his whole belief was that it was the industrial revolution that really created a whole new class of individuals who could literally come from nowhere and become major economic players, uh, unlike anything that had happened before. And uh, so he was uh, the I think that the, the, uh, technically the Industrial Revolution starts in 1776, in March of 1776, and it's when James Watt uh, uh, introduced a, an improved steam engine that got a 25% energy return, which was phenomenal. It, it'd probably be, it'd still be phenomenal in some centers, but it was that sudden where almost any individual who was ambitious, who was enterprising, who was ingenious, could now use a new technology to uh, massively transform productivity in all existing industries, starting with uh, basically the fabric industry was where it was first used. And I mean, uh, as a real productive, it was used to get water out of coal mines in Great Britain. That was the main purpose. But uh, it created two classes. It created um, the entrepreneurs who were these people who could come from nowhere and create uh, great enterprises and great fortunes. And it created the intellectual class. There was no class called the intellectual class. And these are the people who hated entrepreneurs because they, they, they didn't deserve their status. They weren't educated. They weren't... Uh, you know, they didn't have aristocracy. They, they hadn't come up the normal way. So, uh, and I think it starts there. And then you see the, the, the 19th century was a phenomenal entrepreneurial decade. And of course, it's gotten exponentially larger. You know, I define an entrepreneur as someone who finds a juicy problem and solves it. Uh, that's my, my definition. And I think uh, today, more than ever, especially during this exponential age, the ability for an in, a single individual uh, to make a dent in the universe, to find a problem, solve a problem, uh, is greater than ever before. Yeah, if you think about what it takes to become an entrepreneur, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, for those who are entrepreneurs, you know it, uh, you thrive on it. I'm on my 
26th or 27th company. Uh, some really good ones, some spectacular failures and everything in between. But I think uh, I would, if I were to rattle off the list of things, first of all, it requires uh, passion or obsession with a, a subject because it's not easy. It's much easier to just get a job and do what you're told. So that's the first thing. I think it requires a reasonably high risk tolerance because if you're really doing something on your own that hasn't been done before and you could lose it all and you're not sure where your next paycheck is coming, which is some part of the early entrepreneurial journey, um, risk is there. And, and then I think there's a certain amount of self-confidence I would say uh, having an understanding of the problem you want to solve and possibly not required an expertise you're bringing to the table because a true entrepreneur um, will not ask how, but who, right? As you've famously said, they'll pull together a team. What are the other elements that you think of an entrepreneur needs to have? Well, I think the one that I've noticed, because I am fascinated in people's history. So whenever I meet an entrepreneur, I said, you know, when you think about the entrepreneurial path, which is definitely a fork in the road from, you know, from the way that most people think about their future, when did you notice it showing up? If you had to go back to the earliest age, that you were doing things different than your peer group was doing, you were doing something different than them and you were you wanted to have a, a direct relationship with the marketplace okay you didn't want a buffer of someone who guaranteed you income didn't guarantee you security you wanted to hit the marketplace yeah. so uh do you remember i mean I, how... I, I i i do i do i remember uh i was in high school i started a a snow removal service uh in my in uh, between my house and my friend's house a few miles away. We went door to door and sold snow re removal for 20 bucks a shot. Wow. Um, that was uh, good I, because that, I, was, that would have been the late 70s. I think. Yeah, the problem was we had a record three-foot snowfall on one day and destroyed the business because I couldn't take care of it. Uh, but, but you know, that was my, my first uh, effort. But my real entrepreneurial journey was my first year at MIT, when I started a um, a national and international student space organization called Students with Exploration and Development of Space. And it was this bold, crazy vision that actually came true. And I was like, wow, this is cool. And there's like this, this element of surprise and delight when you start a business and people, and it was a nonprofit, but, uh, and and it, I got it, I got hooked, I got addicted on the idea of an idea and creating something that people would participate. How about you, Dan? What was yours? Well, I grew up on a farm, so uh, farming is a very risky entrepreneurial business, and our farm failed. And um, my father um, recreated himself at age 60 as a landscaper and had his best. He worked right till he was 82, and he had his best business here, and he left uh, um, you know, my mother, um, he died at 83, but he, he worked full time uh, when he was um, 82. And then he packed it in. He packed it in. He said, I can't do it anymore. And my feeling is that the day my father um, wasn't doing business, he didn't know what he who he was. And he, yeah, and he just he said, I'm out of here, you know, uh, and that that joy that you talk about the excitement. And a lot of it is just the applause. I think applause really keeps people in the game. Teamwork, um, deadlines, um, you know, having to cre create new solutions, but you're doing it face to face with the marketplace. So, you know, you're 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 you're, you're really getting the best kind of research for the development of what you're doing. And it's check writers. Check writers are crucial and you want to be paid directly you don't want to go through a third party you don't want to have five levels of yes. money coming down to you and what i noticed just to finish this topic that it shows up very early i mean the the instinct for it shows up um um it, where it's chosen i i think there are people who are forced into it because of the failure of a, a large employer and that happens but i noticed the ones who start early um uh, tend to create new things more than the people who are forced into it. And um, yeah, and 
Yeah, and and you had a very uh, divided, uh, not only uh, postgraduate, but you had uh, you were already at it in undergraduate because you have your famous getting your medical medical degree because yeah. because it received your medical school received the least amount of your passion and <laughs> yes, it, very true. I mean, when you're hooked as an entrepreneur, you you love what you're doing and you're excited to jump out of bed in the morning and go and see what are the results of what I did yesterday and what can I do different today? Um, you know, Dan, I think it'd be interesting to ask a question and, and get your insights. And I have a few to add of what don't people realize about entrepreneurship? Like what are some of the surprises uh, that uh, um, if you haven't been an entrepreneur and you become an entrepreneur, what are the surprises that uh, that most people don't know about? No, go ahead. Um, I, have, I have one. I have one. I'm going to say the surprise is you're going to spend more time with your coworkers and your co-founders than you will your family or your kids. Um, you know, it's a uh, uh, the reality is starting a company is never easy. Uh, most companies are, you know, overnight successes after 10 years of hard work. Uh, and so pick your co-founder and your, your employee team that you're working with carefully because they're going to be as close to you and sometimes closer than family. What about you, Dan? What else? Surprises? Yeah, I think the biggest thing uh, I often said, if there's a God in the entrepreneurial heaven, the name of that God is cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. The getting the cash flow routine because you're um you have to market and you have to create in, in other words and it takes a while for you to get these two together that you can't just create and solve problems and then start marketing you have to do both of them at the same time and uh, i think that's the hardest thing i see more bankruptcies i see more failed businesses just because they didn't get cash flow down i went bankrupt twice in the uh, late 70s and early 80s and uh, it was strictly receivables that killed me you know so in 84 we made a decision that we me talking to myself um, uh, uh, that um, I would never have another receivable that what I was doing would get paid for up front and uh, and uh, people said well people just won't do that and I said well I'm just going to find the check writers who would be willing to do it. But there you really have to be thinking in terms of their goals. You have to really be thinking. And I think that's the next thing that uh, you have to understand that all of your money is in the aspirational future of your best clients. This episode is brought to you by Levels. One of the most important things that I do to try and maintain my peak vitality and longevity is to monitor my blood glucose. More importantly, the foods that I eat and how they peak the glucose levels in my blood. Now, glucose is the fuel that powers your brain. It's really important. High, prolonged levels of glucose, what's called hyperglycemia, leads to everything from heart disease to Alzheimer's to sexual dysfunction to diabetes, and it's not good. The challenge is all of us are different. Uh, all of us respond to different foods in different ways. Like for me, if I eat bananas, it spikes my blood glucose. If I eat grapes, it doesn't. If I eat bread by itself, I get this prolonged spike in my blood glucose levels. But if I dip that bread in olive oil, it blunts it. And these are things that I've learned from wearing a continuous glucose monitor and using the Levels app. So Levels is a company that helps you in analyzing what's going on in your body. It's continuous monitoring 24 seven. I wear it all the time. It really helps me to stay on top of the food I eat, remain conscious of the food that I eat, and to understand which foods affect me based upon my physiology and my genetics. You know, on this podcast, I only recommend products and services that I use, that I use not only for myself, but my friends and my family, that I think are high quality and safe and really impact a person's life. So check it out, levels.link slash Peter. We give you two additional months of membership, and it's something that I think everyone should be doing. Eventually, this stuff is gonna be in your body, on your body, part of our future of medicine today. It's a product that I think uh, I'm gonna be using for the years ahead and hope you'll consider as well. You said something really important 
about cash flow being critical. You know, as an entrepreneur, you're going to make a decision <clears throat> early on on if you're going to use your own money and your own blood, sweat, and tear to get the company going, are you planning at the end of this to own 100% of your own company? Or are you going to go out there and raise money from you know friends, families, uh, angel investors, venture capitalists, and slowly you know dilute yourself from 100% ownership down to many times it may be down to 20% or 10%. And I've done both, <clears throat> and some of the crazy moonshot ideas um, require massive amounts of outside capital. But the companies that I've started and owned myself, and I started the company based upon making the first sales and building it on cash flow, have been the most fulfilling. Um, do you want to speak to that, Dan? Well, um, <laughs> I can remember when um you know we started collaborating and a360 got created and it was at the first really big one we did a sample version in uh in, in at, at su's in silicon valley right yeah yeah and um and uh that's when i became fully human in your eyes because <laughs> you brought check writers <laughs> i brought i felt uh, i put butts in seats you know <laughs> and i said i don't think you I, I i think i was more of an abstraction or a theory before before that and uh i remember um the day before we did that uh, first event which was incredibly successful and has been ever since um all the money was already in you hadn't put any you hadn't put the presentation on and uh I said uh he said boy all the money I haven't I haven't actually presented anything yet <laughs> everybody bought the tickets in advance everybody bought the tickets and uh, and so um I've taken I've just stuck with that one model for our whole life and we're up you know um uh the real program uh strategic coach program i had 15 years of one-on-one -on -one, and then i we went to a workshop uh, for him and the reason was that babs and i are americans who live in canada and uh, when we moved to canada they said uh, that the tax system is uh, voluntary and i thought it meant optional <laughs> 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 and then I had this uh, true Canadian call me up with a distinctly Indian voice and said, oh, Mr. Sullivan, you've been a very, very naughty boy. <laughs> 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 you do not want to own the government money because we'll tax you on the money you pay us for. And uh, so the one on one career was over and I said, we're going to have to do a workshop to pay our taxes. And I and I say that because uh there's the story that entrepreneurs tell about how their business you know they were very systematic they were very strategic and then there's the actual story <laughs> that actually got you started and uh we were scared silly because we didn't think we could coach a room full of people and we had six people in the first group and we weren't charging same as if i was cha charging for a whole year for a single individual but it was 80 percent times six so it was five times bigger yes and, and i died and went to heaven on that day i tell you uh and i agree I mean, when, when you get entrepreneurs and they're talking to each other they yes. love the failure stories yes That's the other thing about entrepreneurs entrepreneurs are the only people who thrive on on um failure stories you, uh, corporate execs you can never get people to talk about that <clears throat> You know, government bureaucrats. Nobody ha talks about their failures because they're swimming among sharks and it's blood in the water. Uh, for sure, for sure. So, other truisms about being an entrepreneur: if you step into that lifestyle, uh, uh, the first, you know, the result is the buck stops with you, uh, and everybody looks to you. Um, uh, something that we talked about in in uh, in conversation before before this podcast was the notion that. Uh, and it's a distinction people need to realize is entrepreneurs don't need to be the CEO of the company. Entrepreneurs hire CEOs many times. And there are different phases of a company, right? In the beginning, it is N of one. It's you. And you're responsible for everything. And you'll bring in a team. 
Um, and then ultimately, uh, you know, the thing I love is taking a role as founder and chairman or founder and executive chairman and hiring a great CEO to run all the day-to-day -day operations, uh, the stuff that I don't love doing. I love the creative. I love the teaching. I love the strategy. I love all of that. Uh, you want to speak about the idea of, uh, of entrepreneurs hiring CEOs? Yeah. Well, uh, in my case, I married my CEO and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or she married me. I'm not quite sure uh, how it went. Uh, but uh, Babs, uh, who's my lifetime um, partner in personal life and business life, um, she was really great at creating teams and to this day has a real gift for putting teams together. OK, and she just looked at me and she says, you're just doing so much one that you're no good at. And, and the other thing is uh, some of the things that you're no good at, you just don't do, like uh, filing with the government and, uh, <laughs> you know, paying attention to to that. And and so uh, from probably uh, the year before we actually started the program, she was just freeing me up. And there's one rule that she has in the company. Uh, and this goes back 34, 34 years, and it's uh, free up Dan. You free up Dan to what he's doing, and you don't have Dan. Like, we we have business meetings to run the company, and if if there's more than three per year, I ask for an investigation. Why am I sitting? <laughs> why, why am I in more meetings? But I'm uh, the way we look at it. It's like a live theater. If you think about the business of a live theater. There's the whole business of the theater, you know, which is, um, you know, uh, all the backstage that has to go in to fill up an audience. And I'm responsible for what goes on stage. I'm, I'm the front stage guy, and it's all my creativity that constitutes the front stage, but everything backstage I have no part of. So is a concept in coach- No, and, and what I say, uh, there, there's no rule for this. There's no room for this. It's how you want to have it. I mean, you cre you created uh, your entrepreneurial business for freedom. You want to be freed up to just do what you're passionate about, what you started the podcast with. It's about passion, but I think it's passion for freedom. Yes. I mean, I, I think a true entrepreneur loves to do what they love to do. Uh, I would say if it's just about making money, uh, you picked the wrong topic. Um, you know, money comes as a result of doing what you love to do and what people need. But I was going to get to the idea that um, that you speak about in Coach, which I love, which is unique ability. And as an entrepreneur, it's understanding what your unique ability is. It could be that you're a coder. It could be that you're a coach. It could be that you're a writer. It could be anything. You can build businesses around any unique abilities. And it's also knowing what you don't love doing and finding people the who's to partner with to do those things you don't love doing. Yeah, I mean, unique ability is really the concept, uh, the cornerstone concept for what we've done. And uh, my whole point is there that everybody's born, and I think this is factory factory installed. People are born with a um, particular passionate interest in some sort of activity. And I think we've talked before about the school system the school system, I think, tries to educate you out of a passion and wants you to be a generalist, you know, that you have to take everything. And, uh, and it's very, very interesting. And we've had about 22,000 entrepreneurs who have, on average, spent three years, uh, three years in the coaching program. And um, I can remember, on one hand, the number of uh, of entrepreneurs in 34 years, well, actually uh, 48 years because I started working with entrepreneurs in 1974. And um, I can't remember any of them saying that their formal education had really anything to do with their entrepreneurism. It's not that, the, that they're opposed to it or they're a thing. It, they just don't, don't see it as a crucial factor to who they are as an entrepreneur. Yeah, no, it's uh, if it does have something to do with you, it you became an entrepreneur during school and then school became a distraction for you along the way. So I have like uh, one of the uh, speakers at Abundance 360 this year, Alexander Wang, who's the CEO of Scale AI, which is a 
multi-billion dollar company. He became the youngest uh, self-made billionaire. And uh, he tells the story that he was at MIT and uh, over the summer, he went to go work on AI and he told his parents it was going to be just this summer thing. And uh, he never went that back. Was, that was the end of school. <laughs> that was the end of school. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I think it so, uh, it's so happens so frequently, um, certainly during the microchip uh, revolution, it happens so frequently that it's almost become a cliche, you know. I think it was, <laughs> you know, she's in prison now, but, uh, you know, Elizabeth Holmes, her big thing was that she followed, you know, she went to Stanford and, you know, got everything she needed in, I think, in not even a year, and then she went out. But that had become sort of a, a model that Steve it was Jobs a, built. It was, a badge, it was a badge of honor to drop yeah. out of school. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you obviously didn't have what it took to... I mean, she had some other interesting issues with her whole uh, presentation, but uh, the thing was that she was following something that had been um, very, very dominant, especially in the 70s, uh, I think it uh, uh, was. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, um, it's it's an interesting thing, but it's almost like folklore, you know. Well, if you go to a university, then you have to drop out at a certain point or start your business and everything else. And, um, you know, but but the vast majority of people do get an education, but it just, it just they got an education because it was what you had to do, but it it didn't figure prominently in the crucial center of why they're a successful entrepreneur. It wasn't like going to medical school to be a doctor or going to law school to become a lawyer. Um, and, you know, I don't actually know whether getting an MBA is that, you know, I, I, there's one reason to go to get your business degree is to meet a lot of other people. It's like the network that you but get. I would but say I, network is the crucial. Yeah. But I, I've written some blogs about the idea. Instead of going and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and getting your MBA, find uh, a great network and plug into it or become an apprentice for someone you want to apprentice for. Let me mention how, another. How did that work for you? I mean, if you go back to your Harvard and your MIT days, I mean, I I didn't. But it, it seems to me that you were making your network outside of both. Of yeah, those. it was all outside. My, you know, I built my space network uh, through that first group I met. Uh, I, I started and founded Students for Exploration and Development of Space. You know, Jeff Bezos was the president of the Princeton chapter, and I met a lot of amazing people, but outside of school. And same thing for medical school. I was, I was, I was checking the boxes and surviving in medical school to get that that diploma and send it to my parents at the end. But my network was outside. Here's another attribute I think is important for entrepreneurs. Um, and I'm curious your thoughts. I think to be a successful entrepreneur, you need to be a great communicator. You need to be a uh, effectively a salesman, uh, saleswoman. You need to have be able to compel your idea and get people uh, to uh, to get it, believe it. Because you're in the beginning, you're selling yourself and you're selling your idea. A brief note from our sponsors. Let's talk about sleep. Sleep has become one of my number one longevity priorities in life. You know, getting eight deep, uninterrupted hours of sleep is one of the most important things you can do to increase your vitality and energy and increase the health span that you have here on Earth. You know, when I was in medical school years ago, I used to pride myself on how little sleep I could get. You know, it used to be five, five and a half hours. Today, I pride myself on how much sleep I can get and I shoot for eight hours every single night. Now, usually I'm great at going to sleep. If I'm exhausted, you know, I've worked a hard day, I'm right out. But if I'm having difficulty, and it occurs, I'm having insomnia or my mind's overactive and I need help to get that eight hours, I turn to a supplement product by Life Force called Peak Rest. Now, Peak Rest has been formulated with an extraordinary scientific depth and background includes everything from long-lasting melatonin to magnesium to L-glycine to rosemary extract, just to name a few. This product is about creating a sense of rest and really giving you the depth and length of sleep that you need for recovery. It's a product I hope you'll try. It works for me and I'm sure it will work for you. If you're interested, go to mylifeforce.com backslash Peter uh, to get a discount from Lifeforce on this product but you'll also see a whole set of other longevity and vitality related supplements that I use 
We'll talk about them some other time. But in terms of sleep, Peak Rest is my go-to supplement. Hope you'll enjoy it. Go to mylifeforce.com backslash Peter for your discount. Can, can I ask you a question about that? Uh, what gets communicated? Uh, you say a great salesperson, but from your experience, because you, you, you've you really been heavily into the uh, venture capital community for a lot of your different uh, ventures, uh, and um, uh, what are they betting on? Are they betting on the idea or are they betting on the person? So I think about funding and phases, right? In the beginning, there's the friends and family round. When you have an idea and you're going out and pitching to get some capital and the friends and family round of any capitalization, if, if you're raising capital, they're only in, in betting on you. And uh, uh, because you don't really have a track record yet. You really don't have a, a, a fundamental idea. And what you want is people putting small amounts of money on you and then following how you succeed. And if you are able to succeed and you keep that community of investors informed, then as they see you succeed or fail and learn a, learn something and, <clears throat> and then succeed, they're going to be willing to put additional money in. And then you know, there's the jockey or the horse, obviously, is the is the is the conversation. But at the end of the day, a great entrepreneur with a mediocre business will reinvent it into a great business. You know, a great business with a mediocre entrepreneur will fail. And so it it needs to have that uh that level of a, a great a great person. But people in the early days are investing in you. And the promise of the idea, they're definitely well, it's the not- only thing real. <laughs> yeah, it's the only thing yeah. real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, another uh, another question uh, about that is really the um, um, uh, the the failure because failure has a totally different meaning in the entrepreneurial world than it does in all other worlds. I, I mean, I can't think of another world. Maybe even where where like in the entertainment industry, it's still. Uh, it's a, still the same model. Babs and I are, uh, I think you may know him or have met him, Jeff Madoff. Uh, yes, and, I know him. And, yeah. and Jeff, um, um, at age 73, decided to write a Broadway play, a Broadway musical play, and it started five years ago. And it opens in Chicago. It's gone through the first uh, route uh, to open outside of New York City. They had workshops in New York and then started in Philadelphia. And they had a three three week run, and it was spectacular. I mean, they got rave reviews and uh, sell out audiences, and now they've gone. But at each level, who was doing the funding moved up a level. That you started off with people you knew when you began, and now it's big big money coming in. And uh, they have a twelve week run in Chicago, right in the center of the. It's called Personality, uh, and it's the musical history of Lloyd Price, who was the real first crossover rock and roll, um, 1951, 1952. And uh, so Babs, I, Babs and I just invested because my first thought in life is I wanted to go into theater, you know, and um, I've got good skills. I've got good theater skills, but I don't have the passion. You know, I wouldn't stick with I wouldn't stick with it. And uh, I said, uh, Jeff, um, We'll pay for the coffee. We'll pay for the coffee. All <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I, uh, we put in. Uh, we're on our third round. We put in. You know, um, you know, not, not insignificant, but certainly not the top um, investor. But now you're you're talking about millions have to come in, and uh, you know it's coming in from foundations. It's coming in from people who are strangers. There's also a different world today as an entrepreneur uh, where capital. You know, capital goes through cycles of being uh, uh, restrictive and hard to get, and capital becomes open and available. You know, in the late dot com revolution, you know, there was like I remember a friend of mine describing Silicon Valley as rivers of gold flowing. All you do is put your ladle and pick it up, and then all of a sudden it shut off instantly. Um, and so it's I, I when I think about you know guidance to an entrepreneur, it's okay to have a big passionate moonshot where you want to impact, you know, millions or billions of people. But I think it's really important to have a business plan that delivers dollar one 
to a customer in the beginning, like you say, check writers, right? Um, because you learn a lot when you actually have to generate revenue at the start versus versus you know theory. How do you, how do you think about that? What's your advice to entrepreneurs who are getting started now? Well, I think the faster you can uh, one, I mean, <laughs> dollar one for the cus uh, for the investor, but dollar one for yourself. So. Babs and I put in a policy right uh, from the beginning that 15% of gross was ours, right off the top every year. And we've done, and we've done that since, um, um, well, uh, since, we, since we started, okay? And uh, we've, you know, I mean, we started off with two employees and now we have 130. You know, we were just in Toronto and now we're in three countries and uh, I have 16 other coaches. And we've just had that constant model. The other thing, and this is a trick of borders, is that we're Americans and Canadians, for the most part, don't know there's another country south of Canada. You know, there, you know, there's this big space on the map. And being an American in Toronto is like being a shark at a beach party, you know. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, there's an aggressiveness to the American marketplace that's, I mean, you can freeze to death up here, and I think it has some, <laughs> something to do up there. And, um, but we've arranged it so that 80% of our revenue is always in American dollars, but repatriated to Toronto. I mean, there's a certain amount of money that we have to keep in our um, uh, uh, American company in Chicago, uh, you know, but it just satisfies the requirements to have a company. And same thing in the UK, but it comes back. But we pay almost all of our expenses with Canadian dollars, and for 34 years, it's been a dollar 26 difference. Uh, so we're getting 26 cents on every dollar. So one of the things I'm only saying that is that um, every entrepreneur works out unique formulas. You know that uh, that's a unique formula, and um, people say, "Well, why do you live in Canada? It's so expensive up there." And I said, "Oh, there's some hedges. You know, there's <laughs> there, there's some offsets. It's also easier to put a team together in Canada than the United States because uh, Canadians are not nearly as mobile as people in the states. There's about twenty there's about twenty big centers that you could find opportunity. In. And Toronto, it's Toronto. You know, uh, Canada, it's basically Toronto or maybe Calgary." It means people stick around for the job for a little bit longer yeah, than yeah so we have ago. 70 who have been more than 10 years we have 25 that are more than uh, 20 years and the payoff for that if they're good people and you're operating according to unique ability and unique ability teamwork uh, there's an enormous institutional wisdom that grows up in the company hey everybody this is peter a quick break from the episode you know, i'm a firm believer that science and technology and how entrepreneurs can change the world is the only real news out there worth consuming. I don't watch the crisis news network I call CNN or Fox and hear every devastating piece of news on the planet. I spend my time training my neural net the way I see the world by looking at the incredible breakthroughs in science and technology, how entrepreneurs are solving the world's grand challenges, what the breakthroughs are in longevity, how exponential technologies are transforming our world, so twice a week, I put out a blog. One blog is looking at the future of longevity, age reversal, biotech, increasing your health span. The other blog looks at exponential technologies, AI, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain. These technologies are transforming what you as an entrepreneur can do. If this is the kind of news you want to learn about and shape your neural nets with, go to demandis.com backslash blog and learn more. Now back to the episode. Dan, what, when you're hearing the pitch from a young entrepreneur, whether they're joining Coach or they're at Abundance 360 or you just meet them someplace, are there are there elements that you say, well, this, this guy or gal is going to be a great entrepreneur or this person's, you know, uh, dreaming? Is, it, is there a way that elements that make you uh, put them in one or the other bucket? That they're, they're, the, the pitch is totally how... Uh, the check writers benefit from this new idea that there's problems that the customer has that are not being solved or there's better ways to solve the dangers they have, the opportunities they have, the strengths they have. 
and you've got a unique take on how they're immediately going to experience benefit. So, and if they don't have a handle on who the customer is, then uh, then they're you know they're making up uh, you know they're they're making up fancy futures. Yeah, that's a real important point. I would I would say it a slightly different way. If you've got someone who's got a neat technology that's searching for a problem, uh, that's a failure mode over and over again. Versus yeah, and you've says, seen. Uh, I mean. Uh, I think yeah. probably the you know the microchip. I I, I think this all starts when uh, Gordon Moore, you know, put together a, a prediction line. You know, in uh, 1965, it wasn't even called microchips. I think 73 is when the term hit on, and um, it was very very clear that this was a historic game changer. That there was going to be something, and um, I think there was a lot of. Um, uh, people throwing solutions at nine problems because people were throwing money at uh, new solutions. But I suspect if you go back to any other, um, you know, since the industrial revolution, that was the case, you know, people, and there are a lot of people have money that they don't need and they just want to throw it at somebody, you know, or, or at some, at some problem to learn about If If you go back, you know, into the late 1800s and the early 1900s, um, when electricity first became uh, viable, the the entrepreneur du jour or the invention du jour was taking a mechanical thing and adding electricity to it. Oh, yeah. Right? You know, the electric Well, dishwasher. in 1910, there were 3,000 car companies in the United States. Crazy. And uh, 40% of them were electric cars. Yeah, that's even crazier. And and now, of course, we're in the midst of the generative AI revolution, where everybody's throwing generative AI at their favorite oh, no. at their favorite no. problem. Uh, it's uh, I mean, it's it's new, but it's class. Uh, there's a classical uh, classic pattern on, on what happens during the early days. People are betting on the bet. They're not actually betting on the, you know, they're uh, in some ways they're not even betting on the thing. They just want to see. You know, I mean, there was the recent example, not naming names here, of um, you know, the in the crypto crypto world, and the guy got two hundred twenty million, and he was in shorts, and somebody said, "I love the founder. I love the founder." You know, <laughs> you know, two hundred twenty. I I just want to give him two hundred twenty million. I, I I I could not I, imagine who that could possibly be. Yeah. All right, so I want to I want to maybe uh, wrap with a, a rapid fire uh, session on this podcast of like advice to someone who wants to be an entrepreneur or thinks they might want to be an entrepreneur. It's like, what do you need to think about? Uh, I'm going to throw out the first one. Um, uh, uh, choose your co-founders wisely. Uh, you're going to you're going to live with them, spend time with them, make sure they bring a different unique ability uh, than you do and that you talk about you're talking all the time and sharing your ideas and your challenges and you have respect for their person what's another piece of advice yeah i would say the other thing is uh uh make your first uh hire an artist really that's unusual what, tell me about that yeah because they can take your ideas and put them into graphic form and can it be dolly two or uh, or a stable diffusion well, I, I mean, uh, I, uh, my rule is I always keep a smart human between me and the technology. Okay. And uh, so, uh, but uh, my first hire was an artist. He was 16 years old and he had, he was into computers, you know, so this was 1987, 1988. And I promised him a Mac two if he came aboard uh, the, the Mac two. Uh, uh, no, it was the little Mac to start with, you know, the little box like Mac. Yeah, the, the Mac, the, the we Mac, told the Mac that Plus. When the Mac 2 came in, they did get the, and, you know, I mean, he, he was a dream. And, <laughs> but I have artistic skills. I was a layout artist in the advertising world. So I knew the basics. And uh, he said, How come we always, use, he says, How come we always use Helvetica? And I said, uh, because everybody uses Helvetica. I know, but we should be different. And I said, there's a reason why everybody uses Helvetica, you know, and uh, and you know, and so I hired an artist, and because we had fantastic slides in those days, and you could tell your whole story. Dan, Dan you're dating yourself way back where? <laughs> Late 1980. I mean, I was old in 1980s. I mean, I'm 
I'm, uh, time, I'm timeless now. Yes, you are. You are. You're only halfway done with life at at at, uh, at least halfway. At 78. Yes. Uh, uh, my next. Oh, that uh, was my first. And I, people said, well, why not a secretary? And I said, uh, first of all, you can hire them by the hour. But you want to get your uh, image of what you're doing in picture form as fast as you can. We now have generative AI to help us on that. I'm going to throw out another one. Uh, pick a subject you're obsessed by, not interested in. That is like that you pick a, a topic for your business or company that you're is your passion about you're obsessed by and it's not a passing fancy it's a passion for or a passion against no pa well it could be a passion for or a passion against right it could be it could be a, a problem that you refuse to let go on any further i'm going to solve this no matter what it takes or i'm ex i'm going to create this because um uh, what's another piece of advice but mine is uh, uh talented successful ambitious entrepreneurs uh who uh, don't have any lifestyle goals that they're heading towards and don't have any uh, status goals. They just have growth goals. Okay. Uh, I, I, I buy that. Um, uh, understand your unique ability um, and, uh, and do that, which you're great at and you love doing, and then bring in partners or employees who do the other stuff for you and support you. Yeah. Oh, another one you mentioned. We mentioned earlier. Uh, generate dollars on day one if you can. Get to check writers. Get a fast turnaround on your first. Um, so I have a ninety-day turnaround on anything new that I create. It's all. It's in the profit after ninety days. You know, and mind you, I'm dealing with ideas. It's not with stuff. You know, so I can do that. But uh, I remember uh, when we uh, when A three sixty got created. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, you're going to have an enormous amount of money before the first day of this. And, uh, and we did. We did. And you were able to grow your team from that. And, uh, and you know. Uh, for for sure. I mean, the equivalent here is build a, mon uh, a minimally viable product, an MVP. You can prototype it. You can start selling it. You can start taking out Google AdWords and testing it you can throw up a shopify page and see if anybody wants it you can go to uh you know a, a variety of platforms and and get hey yeah today cu get right. customer feedback get yeah. customer yeah. feedback yeah and there's only um the only person who uh, can tell you it's a good idea is somebody who would write a check for it there, there no, nobody else is your friends your family especially not your staff you're paying them they they don't think any new idea is that good i you know it's well it's interesting right uh, on the flip side sometimes your staff will tell you it is a good idea when it isn't i remember i was uh, interviewing elon musk on a on a goldman sachs uh, uh stage and and he said something i never forget he said your friends tell you how great everything is your best friends tell you what suck so make sure you've got people yeah but check writers will just tell you that uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't pay for it the way it is, but if you made some adjustments, and that's great market research, you know. And I think it, you mentioned Elon, and I think Elon is the, uh, from my perspective, um, you know, which is not close like yours is, he is, of all the big tech people, I think he's the truest entrepreneur of them all. Yeah, for sure. Sees a problem, jumps on it. Well, not only that, but he continually takes big risks, okay? Yes. And the other thing he's got a very interesting, which I totally agree with, is fail as fast as you can and as often as you can. And pretty soon you're going to get to something that nobody else could possibly have created. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, he, uh, he's got a different kind of nervous system, I think. He does. He's also uh, one of the most extraordinarily intelligent individuals I've ever met in my life. Uh, who has a first principle thinking mindset. Yeah. He read and almost memorized whole encyclopedias when he was a kid. <laughs> and you no, know, no, I mean, uh, he, his understanding of geopolitics and uh, everything. I mean, when Elon makes a big decisions like a $10 million factory in Mexico. 10 billion, uh, right, yeah. 10, 10, 10 billion, 10, <laughs> 10, 10, 10 million. 10, yeah, you can't round off with 10 million. <laughs> <laughs> but $10 billion factory, 
he's sensing something in the wind. You know, and the thing is that, uh, you know, um, that there's a shift on and where the, you know, uh, North America, uh, the United States, Canada and Mexico have just tested out, you know, uh, supply chains from all over the world that aren't dependable. And he said, uh, one of the things everybody's decided, it can be in Mexico, but it has to be on the continent. You can do it by truck, you can do it by train, you can do, you know, and everything. But the other thing, the pay scales in Mexico are about one sixth the pay scales in the United States. At almost every level, the US is six times the pay scale. And you have to have that with high technology. You gotta have this spectrum of pay scales uh, you know, for it. I, I just uh, think, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, he, he bought Twitter and everybody says, you know, he's just fooling around. It's like buying, buying somebody buying a baseball team. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, uh, I mean, it's really dangerous to second, second guess Elon Musk. Yeah, no, my, my guess is that uh, when he takes it public again, it'll be at least 5x uh, what he bought it for. Um, with a, a number of new revenue streams. Okay, uh, my last thought uh, uh, on on entrepreneurship here to close out our podcast here, buddy, um, is it is one of the highest forms of artistic creativity. You're creating something that can change the world. If you've got a bent for it, if you're interested in it, I could not commend it more than you know, a way of life. It is extraordinary. I, I love being an entrepreneur and I love hanging out with entrepreneurs. And I think they're the most important forces of, of making the world a better place. Yeah. And the, the I talk to people as if it's a career choice. It's not a career choice. It's a lifetime choice. Okay. <clears throat> and I said, you have to understand that if you've been at it for five or 10 years, this is a life sentence. <laughs> there's no going back you can't go they for, you won't can't. have you back and what are you going to show them for the 10 years you know well uh, who did you work for i mean can, you know uh who, who withheld your tax at uh you know at source and everything like that you know you, be, you become unemployable after, oh, after a year or two yeah, being an entrepreneur. i would say that that's uh, that's the actual decision that takes the greatest commitment this is for life you know your whole life <laughs> Your whole life, and certainly mine. I mean, uh, uh, the day I quit will be the day after I die. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, for sure. All right, buddy. As always, a pleasure to spend a, time with you. That was a good riff. That was that, a good, that yeah. was that was fun. All right. See see you soon. See you next time. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Peter.